Well, it's good to see you today. I'm going to read from Paul's first letter to Timothy and to chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> and this is what we read from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And that's all we're going to read as we think a little bit more about the Gospel today. Many people think that John 3.16 is the best summary of the Gospel. And you may know it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A very famous verse. I prefer this one, actually. Nine simple words that tell us everything about the good news of Jesus Christ. So let's look at these nine simple words together. They are, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul begins by saying this is a faithful saying. These faithful sayings that are mentioned in Timothy and Titus are probably fragments of hymns that Christians, early Christians, would have sung. Or possibly words of doctrine that they learned when they were to be baptised. We don't know, but it would appear as if it is something that was familiar to people in the days in which Paul lived. Let's remember Christians in those days did not have the New Testament as we have it. Um, I suppose many of them did not know how to read, so they would have learned certain things or sung certain things. And this seems to be one such faithful saying, one such summary of Christian truth. Let me tell you again what it is. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let's think first of all of the word Christ. Most people use it today as a swear word. They stub their toe, or they drop Granny's Ming vase, and the first thing they say is this word. Men despise it. Satan wants men to despise it. But what does it mean? Well, the word Christ is really a, me a word that means the Messiah, the promised one of God. God promised to his nation Israel that he would send a Messiah. He would send a Saviour. He said that right from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. He said that he would send the seed of the woman who would bruise the serpent's head. And many people believe that that is the first promise that a Saviour would come. Over the years, prophets and priests and kings had spoken about the coming of this Messiah, this Christos, as he was called in Greek. The word therefore means God's promised Saviour, God's Messiah, the one for whom the world was waiting until eventually he came. And when he came, what did men call him? They called him Jesus. The angel said when he was to be born, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And Mary and Joseph broke with tradition, didn't call him Joseph after his supposed father, but called him Jesus. And the word Jesus really means Jehovah is Saviour, or Jehovah is salvation. What an appropriate name to give one to one who was Christ, the promised Messiah. Of course, when he lived down here, people called him Jesus of Nazareth. Because although he was born in Bethlehem, he was brought up in Nazareth. And he was known as Jesus of Nazareth, the carpenter's son. He probably was a carpenter himself, because all Jews, male Jews, had to have a trade. They were taught something, and no doubt Joseph, his stepfather, would have taught him carpentry. So there's your first two words. Christ, the promised Messiah, was called Jesus. And he was Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, when he was down in this world, people refused to accept that he was the Christ. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? 
Is there any good thing that can come out of such a, uh, such a, a little village, an insignificant village as that, they said? And they refused to accept that he was the Christ. But those who did believe that he was the Christ knew the joy of having their sins forgiven and knew what it was to have peace with God. There's these two words then, Christ, who was called Jesus. The next phrase says, he came into this world. Now think of that for a minute or two. When a baby is born, we don't say this baby has come into this world. We say this baby is born. The baby begins its existence. For many of us, the baby begins their existence at conception in the womb and then is born into this world. But this Christ Jesus came into this world. That implies that he had an existence before he came. And the Bible would tell us that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. In other words, God sent his Son into the world for a purpose. And that purpose was to save sinners. Now, if you and I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him, if we accept his death for us upon the cross, we will go to God. But none of us have ever come from God. But this Christ, who was called Jesus, came from God. He came into this world. He himself would say when he lived in this world, that he had come to seek and to save those who were lost. That was the purpose of his coming, to be a savior, to be a messiah, to be the Christ. And the Father sent the Son into the world says the scripture, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, yes, Mary. Born under the law, yes, a Jew, that he might redeem those that were under the law. And he was sent. He came into this world. John tells us a great deal about this in his first chapter of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Who was this Word? He goes on to tell us. The Word became flesh. He came into this world. The world became flesh and dwelt amongst us, he said, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. When Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and laid in that manger in Bethlehem, that was not the beginning of his existence. He had been with God from before the foundation of the world. As the Son of God, he had created the world. But he came into this world. The Father sent him to do his will. Christ, therefore, called Jesus came into this world to save. Again, we remember the Bible tells us, and the Lord Jesus tells us, he did not come to condemn, but he came to seek and to save. Now, why did we have to be saved? That's the question. That isn't really mentioned in John 3.16, but it's mentioned here. Christ Jesus came into the world to save. Why did we need to be saved? Because according to the teaching of the scripture, we are all under the condemnation of God from the moment that Adam first sinned in the Garden of Eden. He brought sin into this world, and with sin came death. And we are separated from God, and we're under the judgment of God. God is a holy God. He cannot bear to look upon sin. He cannot excuse it. He cannot turn a blind eye to it. He must judge it. And therefore he sent his son to save us from his judgment. To save us from the punishment that was rightly ours. Why was it rightly ours? The next word will tell us. To save sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is sin? We used to teach our children a catechism, a children's catechism when they were small. I can remember them all, including Hannah, lisping the answers. 
doing her best to get her little tongue when she was four or five around some of the big expressions of the catechism. This is one of them. What is sin, is the question. And our children learn from the age of three or four. Sin is either failing to do what God commands or doing what God forbids. You see, sin is both things. We all know sin as doing what God forbids. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. God forbids these things, and when we do them, that is sin against him. And remember, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. They have all turned aside, every single one of us. Sin is doing what God forbids. But sin, according to that answer, is also failing to do what God commands. What sort of commands are they? Honour your father and mother as one. And there's many a person has failed to do that. But here's the first one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And we've all failed to do that. We have failed to do what God commands, as well as doing what God forbids. And you may say to me, I'm not such a bad sinner. I haven't committed adultery. I don't steal. I don't swear. I don't this, that, and the other. But have you loved the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? If you haven't, you have sinned. We're all sinners, says the Bible. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's not a happy thing to be a Welsh rugby fan these days, is it? To be fair. It's a very miserable thing indeed. Especially when you have Irish friends who like to crow. A little while ago, I was over in Bandon in Southern Ireland for a conference. I got rather fed up of them. They would say to me when we were having lunch or tea, would you like a cup of tea? I said, no, thank you, I've already got one. Would you like a wooden spoon to stir it with? Things like that, they really get your goat, don't they? There we are, we deserve it, I suppose. We're not doing very well. But one of the things that I found interesting in rugby laws is the way in which they refer to breaking the rules as going to the sin bin. Sin is not a popular word in British language, English language today. But they've got it. You get a yellow card, you are sent to the sin bin. You have broken the rules. We've all sinned against God. We've all broken the rules. And as a result of that, we are to be sent, and I say this with due reverence, to his sin bin known as hell, a place of judgment. But Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners so that we don't need to go to that sin bin. Instead, we can have our sins forgiven. We can have those yellow cards withdrawn and we are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So how did he save? Well, he saved because he died on a cross for sinners. Says the Bible, he bore our sin in his own body on the tree. God laid our iniquities on him. And with his stripes we are healed. And if we put faith and trust in that death of Jesus Christ as our substitute on the cross, God will save us from that eternal sin bin. He will give us a place in heaven. We will become his children. We will no longer be under the condemnation of sin. We will know what it is to be justified, to be forgiven because of Christ's death on a cross. Nine simple words. But when you look at them, don't they tell us what the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is all about? God sent his son into this world to save sinners. Christ, the Messiah, who men called Jesus, came into this world. He was sent into this world, having existed as the Son of God before this, to save sinners. That's the language of the gospel. 
The next part of the phrase is the language of faith. It says this, of whom I am chief. In other words, Paul recognized and admitted and confessed that he was a sinner. In fact, he confessed he was probably one of the worst. That doesn't mean he lived an ungodly life, not at all. As far as the law of God was concerned, he was virtually perfect. But he persecuted Christians. He didn't like the fact that they believed in this Jesus of Nazareth. He put men and women, perhaps even children, into prison, and some of them may be tortured in order to deny their faith, and he never forgot when he became a Christian what he had once done. He would say, I am the chief of sinners. When we lived in Botswana, we obviously had to learn the language. And Robert Moffat, who was father-in-law to David Livingston, was the one who actually translated the Bible into Setswana. It was one of the first African languages that had the Bible in Setswana, and it was David Livingston's father-in-law who translated it. And having done the work, he also had to uh, uh, show them how to, how to write and how to read. They didn't know anything of this beforehand. Uh, he would read his translation back to them just to make sure that he'd got it right. And when he came to this point, it says, Of whom I am chief, he said, Ba'ilen Khosi, Mohobone, Khosi. Khosi means the head of the clan, the chief of the clan. That's not what this Bible, this verse says. Paul is not saying he's the chief of the Christian clan as though he's the head man, as though he's the king, he's the ruler. What he means by saying, of whom I am chief, he says, of whom I am the worst. That's what it is, the worst. The language of faith takes the language of the gospel. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and says, I'm one of them. I am a sinner. Perhaps even a worse sinner than anybody else. But I believe in my heart that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am one of them. If anybody speaks to me down in Tenby about whether or not they have faith and they would say, well, you know, I'm a church goer, I do this, I do that, I'm a good living person, I'm... that's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is somebody saying, I'm a sinner. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I believe and trust in him. And that means, of course, that they are now born again of the Spirit of God and will no longer be under his judgment. Remember John 3.16? Yes, do. For God so loved the world that he gave, again, there it is, his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But don't forget these simple words of faithful saying and worthy of you to accept Christ the Messiah became Jesus of Nazareth. He came into this world for a purpose. The purpose was to save sinners. I hope and trust that he has saved you from the judgment of God because he has saved me by his grace. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, again, we give thanks.